holiday show several years ago. So she's no stranger to this room. You're listening to Mountain Stage, live performance radio from the Mountain State of West Virginia. Major funding for Mountain Stage is provided by Bailey Glasser, LLP, a nationwide law firm born in West Virginia, taking on your toughest cases. More online at baileyglasser.com. And by the West Virginia Department of Tourism. West Virginia, a place that's almost heaven, where country roads lead to outdoor adventure, charming small towns, and places that feel like home. Your trip begins at wvtourism.com. Additional support is provided by the Charleston, West Virginia Convention and Visitors Bureau, helping you discover the undiscovered. Adventures available online at charlestonwv.com. This is Mountain Stage on NPR. You're listening to Mountain Stage on 91.3 WYSO. Ever wanted to get loud in the library? From WYSO, Dayton Metro Library and the International College of Broadcasting, Tiny Stacks is back. The series brings leading local musicians into Dayton libraries to perform for the public. With concerts last year from Amber Hargett, Tino, and Rusted Reserve. Tiny Stacks is now accepting applicants for its 2024 season. Whether you're a singer, a DJ, a rapper, or the member of a band, you can apply at DaytonMetroLibrary.org slash Tiny Stacks. The clouds are going to stay with us for the next couple of days and bring in more showers. Mountain Stage continues. Great music right here on 91.3. Join Tangella and I every Saturday night for Creature Features right here on CATV. value their local programming and no one produces more local programming than local communities through the provision of public educational and governmental access channels our communities are kept informed educated and entertained legislation that threatens the support of these channels received will undermine local government's ability to support serve and protect its citizens here's what public educational and governmental access are all about and why you should care and why you should keep it local PCN is very valuable to us. Uh, I get to see the House uh, proceedings because I'm in the, when I'm in the Senate, I get to come back and watch the House proceedings. I get to go back and see committee meetings uh, that I can't make all these meetings at one time. Well, obviously your, your meetings, your municipal meetings, your school board meetings, uh, I think are very valuable to citizens to find out what's really going on in their government. Many people can't get out to those meetings. It really does benefit all the elected officials, the local elected officials, it really does benefit their, their constituents. I've seen firsthand what kind of information we're able to get out as local elected officials and uh, what kind of information has been kind of tough to get across to the communities and the capacity that a true cable network, public access access cable network um, can give. Cable uh, television access is uh, so widespread. I mean, uh, so many people watch television, they're watching cable. It would really enable us to get more and better and quicker information to the people. Talking to example, the Federal Emergency Management Agency on the importance of uh, they as a, as a federal agency um, that could use access in times of natural, uh, natural uh, and national emergency. Uh, we're finding it uh, greatly improving the quality of life um, in our town. It allows us to bring much more timely information uh, to all of our residents. Whether it be police, fire, emergency management, schools will have the ability to get instant messages out to them in the event of an emergency. It's turned into our primary method of communication, not only uh, for school related matters, but for community uh, matters as well. I can't really imagine the school uh, communicating today without the cable access channel. The channel is really the eyes and ears of the entire community. Public access is, is kind of like the library in, in, in that we check out the book, but we don't read it to you. We're not so much in the TV game, we're really in the empowerment game. We're empowering the community with the, 
you know, the tools, knowledge, and access to media. And how can that that's how can that not be exciting? You can come into the access center and talk about all kinds of things, local things, and you can put on local stuff that wouldn't normally be on any TV station. Stuff that's interesting, all the locals. I think that public access is one of the only places where you truly have freedom of speech. All voices are welcome, all people are welcome, and it's the most unique thing that we have in the media, to me. Uh, you can't get any more pure than the people talking and, and their points of view and their ideas. And I think that's why access is so special. People watch access. And I think that's it's very encouraging. I think it's, it's fun to watch. But through access, we're keeping the high neighbor mentality. What type of programming is available through the PEG channels? We are Tucson. Tucson 12. The City Channel. Hi, I'm Tucson Police Bike Officer Erica Stropka. And I'm Tucson Fire Engineer Clint Moss. We're here at the La Placita Village downtown. Hello everyone, I'm Ricardo Rico and welcome to 12 Answers, where we ask you to join discussions on the issues affecting our community. And here's what we have for you on this edition of City News. Miracle Mile loses a landmark and residents rejoice. Hi, I'm Scott Barton and welcome to Zoo News. Zoos and aquariums work really hard to provide great lives for our animals. And that includes... Tucson, Tucson 12, the City Channel. Welcome to Inside Clackamas County. I'm Clackamas County Commissioner Martha Schrader. And I'm Kimberly Jacobson. Thanks for joining us. You know, two Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I do solemnly swear. I do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. In Clackamas County, dozens of criminals are caught every year from information provided by citizens. This is the Clackamas County Sheriff's Most Wanted, a show where your tips can help us apprehend criminals. Grab your wine glasses because inside Clackamas County is going wine tasting at four local vineyards. You're watching the Clackamas County Government Channel. It has changed as a result of these two catastrophes and uh, we, we can rebuild. But we're either going to do it the right way, the new way. I want to have accountability. I want to make sure these people focus on the protecting the people's lives and people's property. EPA is operating in St. Tammany with uh, household hazardous waste collection and disposal program. 35% of the state's economy has been wiped out. When you lose 35% of your economy, it just doesn't affect our region. It affects the whole state. I guess they don't know about the $8.1 billion in outstanding bonded indebtedness at the local level that if we default on is going to hurt the state and political subdivisions credit rating for centuries. Whatever impact Katrina left on you and whatever your circumstances, the staff at Channel 10 wish you the very best of holidays. Assume that you will not be able to buy food or water. Your electricity and gas supplies will be interrupted and there will be no refrigeration. You'll also need a means to provide essential lighting for your home during the evening hours. 
a means of receiving information from authorities, the most critical element of your hurricane plan is living through a storm. But before you have any work done, the Miami-Dade Building Department wants to make sure you obtain the proper permits so you can safely rebuild. After Hurricane Katrina, Miami-Dade County cleans up from the storm and reaches out to victims in the Gulf Coast region. Looking ahead, from air to sea, the future seems bright for the county's two largest economic engines. Good day and welcome to Issue York Congress. I'm Jim Davis. We've developed this program to introduce you to the City of Tampa's recommended budget for fiscal year 2005. Tampa is a city set in an environment of natural beauty. The bays, the river, and the many lakes and ponds. Oh, my shirt slips up and I fill my coffee cup. Why should the funky blues right off my face? I just wanted to, to try to do something that was different enough to be special. Because it is part of what we do. Isamu Noguchi's sculpture, Black Sun, is one of thousands of public artworks in Seattle. What most people don't know is that Seattle's maritime business is big business. Black Nativity lends community and art together on the stage. Hello, I'm Eric Liu. I'll be your host as we celebrate the opening of our new downtown central library. Hi, and welcome to the show, coming to you from Consolidated Works. 1991, Al Gore discovers the internet. And now, Seattle TV viewers discover The Seattle Channel. On September 11th, as I ran through the Longworth office building helping to evacuate it because we had just seen the Pentagon explode out my window, I began to wonder what happened if terrorists were to succeed with a nuclear device or another airplane. In Clark County, people with developmental disabilities are gaining employment and proving to be business assets. Companies are benefiting from this workforce's equal or higher job performance ratings, retention rates, and lower absenteeism. Children are not, not allowed to just ride their bicycles like when I was younger. And with TV and video games, it's a very important time to be a teacher. and dad followed Billy up and down every single aisle. What kind of bucket are you looking for, they asked. More than 500 boys and girls ages 10 to 18 came together from many of Boston's neighborhoods to celebrate the successful 2004 Metro Lacrosse Spring season. Kathy, congratulations to you and your organization and to the young people here who have really taken a stand against underage drinking. I think David Brednor has joined me on the set before to talk about living with HIV and now he's back in more ways than one. David, thanks for coming back. Thank you, Jim. I'm glad to be here again. We, have a we are honored to present the city of Boston's African American Achievement Award for Community Service to Carol Bradley Moore, headmaster of the Jeremiah E. Burke School for Outstanding Educational Contributions. Welcome to Clark County Chronicles. I'm Kim Sherwood. And I'm Randy Swallow. Clark County is taking flight in the fight against ozone pollution. That's right. Air sample. Hello and welcome to Flight Path. I'm Elaine Sanchez, Public Affairs Manager. We begin with a look at our push for airplane space. Going. Just Las Vegas. The nighttime is energized in our nonstop city, and so is the sixth busiest airport in the country. The airlines have figured out an interesting phenomenon with Las Vegas. They can bring planes that would otherwise be idle, say a plane that might park overnight in an airport, say like Pittsburgh, at 8 or 9 o'clock at night. Speaking of animal people, I'm thrilled to have as a co-host Joe Botello, the Chief Animal Control Officer in Clark County. Joe, welcome. No kitties or no canines in the show today. No, there aren't. And as I pulled up and I saw, I saw the front end of the car from the dash forward, 
uh, literally torn away from the rear end of the car and the rear end of the car wrapped around. Welcome to this edition of DTV Newsbreak, and thanks for joining us. Your pet can be a star on June 5th at the 11th Annual Dog Days of Summer Celebration. More than a game. It's a way of life, really, for those particular people who are a part of it. We give guidance to um, the people on the other side on how to do CPR. T today was the first time I met the man, and he really is a sincerely dedicated person. From all of us here at DTV Newsbreak, have a great Thanksgiving weekend and a good night. Public, educational, and governmental access channels empower individuals and groups to utilize television to educate and enrich communities on a broad scale. It is a critical tool for local government to provide emergency information to their community. It also allows the public to view its local government at work. Without this powerful tool, communities may be deprived of the ability to provide these important communication services.
Time for one more song before we go. And uh, this is one of the most, you couldn't have an Irish sing song without singing this song. It's probably one of the most, if not the most, popular Irish folk song out there. This is Whiskey in the Jar.
Whack for the daddy o, whack for the daddy o. Let's just keep the job. I spent all of this money and it was a pretty penny. I put it in my pocket and I brought it off to Jenny. She signed and she swore that she never would see me. But the devil took that when I bought it. Never can be easy with sharing the money or not. Whack for the daddy o, whack for the daddy o. Let's just keep the job. Sure, it's what no wonder. Jenny threw the charges and she filled them up with water. And sent for Captain Frow to be ready for the slaughter. But sure, he'll never do them a die. Whack for the daddy o, whack for the daddy o. Let's just keep the job. Was early in the morning before he rose to travel. Up came a band of footmen, like my captain Farrell. When I first produced my pistol, he stole a rim and rapier, but I couldn't shoot the water. So a prisoner I was taken, but sure he'd never do no die. Whack for the daddy o, whack for the daddy o. There's whiskey in the jar, I'm a sure he'd never do no die. Whack for the daddy o. Whack for the daddy o, there's whiskey in the jar. If anyone could aid me, it's me, brother in the army. And if I could find a station and conquer it, the irony. And if you go with me, we go hurling through Kilkenny. I'm sure you'll treat me better than me, God has brought you to me. My sure, you never do, never die. Whack for the daddy o, whack for the daddy o, there's whiskey in the jar. My sure, you never do, never die. Whack for the daddy o, whack for the daddy o. There's whiskey in the jar. I'm a sharing of a new number. Whack for the daddy o, whack for the daddy o. There's whiskey in the Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That was the High Kings. Their latest album is called The Road Not Taken. Look for a new album out this summer. Featuring Steve Perry from Journey, the High Kings. Yes, indeed. Did I tell you you wouldn't be able to sit still? Thank you to the High Kings. Thanks to Catherine Russell, to Kindred Valley. Thank you to Tom Paxton and to the Don Juans. Thank you to everyone here at the Keith Albee Performing Arts Center and to our friends at the Martial Artist Series. And thanks to you out there listening on the radio because without you, there'd be no mountain stage. We never forget that. I hope you'll be back next week when we are back home at the Culture Center Theater with Calexico, Steve Forbert, David Wax Museum, David Huckfelt, and Anna Mika. Mountain Stage is produced by Larry Gross and Adam Harris. Senior producer is Jeff Shirley. Associate producers are John Ingram and Mallory Richards. We're engineered by Patrick Stevens, Richie Collins, Jim Raines, Brian Hensley, and Greg McGowan. With production assistance by Michael Lipton, Lance Schrader, Chris Mead, Mary Lee, Kelly Lassiter, and Big J. Photographic services by Chris Morris. Promotion is coordinated by Mallory Richards, John Ingram, and Music in Motion Promotions. Special thanks to Mountain Stage members Walter and Sean Williams for their generous support. Lodging is provided by the Marriott Town Center Hotel, centrally located for the business and pleasure traveler in downtown Charleston. Why don't you go out and hear some live music wherever you are, just as soon as you can? You've been listening to Mountain Stage, live performance radio from the Mountain State of West Virginia. 
with one of Tom Paxton's most beloved songs. Tom, you can start us out, if you will. He was a man and a friend always stuck with me. Major funding for Mountain Stage is provided by Bailey Glasser and by the West Virginia Department of Tourism. This is NPR. Thank you for sharing part of your Saturday evening with us. You're listening to 91.3 WYSO. It's jazz and country, blues, pop. Where did this start? How did this end? Why did it have to go in this direction? Do I love her? Is this a problem? Does she Do love me? He helped. Why am I? Am I losing my mind? Is this sad? Am I okay? Did I do something to you? Guys? Do if I'm depressed, this mental state. Why did I have if to If I am in depression, why did I have to if go. How do I get out? Am I here now? If I don't, do I keep myself in depression? How do I know this? Do I need help? Why do people always go away? Or is my daughter so Why does she make me feel? Or is this the product of a natural source? Why didn't she listen to me? Where did this start? What did I do to sleep? How will this be my fault? It's starting to scare my life. It's not my fault. This is my situation. How long will this last? Will I have to do it? Will I live like this for a does she ever think like about to go in this direction? Questions. How illustrations of an unknown means to an end. Questions never bothered me until she stopped talking to me. Do I love her? The shrink told me we fall in love with the one we have an unresolved conflict with. What did I do? I guess he was right. Is this my fault? So, question one. Where did this problem start? Before the conflict or after the conflict? First day of winter quarter. I see her for the first time in a class I don't care much about, but have to take. She's a goddess. The only thing in the room that matters. I don't know her. She doesn't know me. We're a clean slate, so I sit next to her. I make eye contact. Let her know my door is unlocked. By the end of class, I get the smile and the look. That special look. The one that lets you know your attention is greatly appreciated. Two weeks, four classes later. I'm a champion. She's always happy to see me. The smiles, the looks, the contact. She's amazing. And I'm so unbelievably giddy. Have I even looked at the syllabus for this class? The winter sky is getting colder. But I have nothing but warmth to look forward to. All signs point to the next step. Come next class, I'm asking her out. <laughs> now this guy's something else. Like a statue, he stands perpendicular to me. Doesn't move a muscle, but his eyes follow me as I pass him. I hear him follow me, and I hear him faintly speak. What do you think you're doing? Excuse me? You better stay away. I take this guy to be one of two things. He's either one of those many eccentric drama students parading around the university in character, or he's just some guy who seems to know me and has a genuine problem with me. I go with my first opinion. She's sitting in her usual spot. My intentions begin making me nervous. The guy follows me into the classroom. He's really beginning to annoy me. He continues his jargon, and the confusion gets thicker. Who do you think you are? 
You better watch it. Okay, are you joking? Do I know you? You just stay away. Confusion is whimsical today. I know what you want. Some of those fine cookies they got next door. I sit down. Next to her, of course. No, she can't know him. Who is this guy? Do you know him? Who is that guy? He just came up and started talking to me. Okay, guys, it's time to get started. Get our seats. Class starts. We have to be quiet now. I'm a little disappointed in the turnout of the last test. What did he say to you? I don't know. I couldn't tell what he was saying. I could barely hear him. He seemed mad, but I don't know. This has got to be the weirdest day I've ever had. Since a handful of people got A's and B's, I don't think it's necessary to implement a curve. He's my boyfriend. If any of you need to see me about the results of your test, don't see me during the office hours. For all of you who scored a C or below, I don't know what made me angrier. The fact that she had a boyfriend, or the fact that he happened to be something out of the Twilight Zone. Question two. Why did she move to the front of the room by the next class? Question three. Why is she now avoiding me? Question four. Did I do something wrong? Everything was perfect. This wasn't supposed to go in this direction. Which question was I on? Five, 10, 27? It's been two months. Next question. Why is she still on my mind? I barely got to know this girl. Yet I'm dying to talk to her again. But I know I can't. So how do I satisfy this feeling? First day of spring quarter. She's in one of my classes again. Is this fate? I get to see her for another two and a half months? She sees me. I want to say hello to her, but I can't. No smile, no comforting look from her. She's on my mind, more than ever. I want to learn everything about her. The more I learn, the more obsessed I become. Well, dude, she rode her bus. She only lives right down the street from her folks. So I had an address, a place near home, a place to drive by and catch a glimpse. Hopefully she'll see me. Maybe she'll wonder about me. She has to. After all, what we had was good. Weeks go by. She still sits in the front, never looking at me, never noticing. After class, I watch. I follow, far enough behind for her not to notice me. All I want to do is talk. The obsession gets stronger. I can't stop thinking about her. She's so beautiful and so perfect and just, I can't get her out of my mind. She's just a person. There's no reason why you can't try talking to her. He's right. No more dawdling. I'm never going to get satisfaction if I don't bring closure to this. The way she looked at me, the way I got a smile out of her melancholy persona. We should have had something and I'm not going to let some paranoid boyfriend come between us. Even if it is really her boyfriend, her and I both know we have unfinished business. I'm so nervous I could faint. Now is the time. She's too quick, as if she knows I'm following. She makes it out the door. I feel like I'm running a marathon. She's about to turn the corner. Hey, Karen! She hears me. Our eyes meet again for the first time in ages. Until this point, only the dreams gave me complete and isolated attention from her. But now I'm not dreaming, and time stands still. Only now her face is different. It's not the look or smile I craved. It was total fear. My boyfriend is waiting. That should have been the last straw. Any sane person would have given up long ago.
but I know too well I'm not exactly wired efficiently. All I did was make it worse. The questions, the dreams, desires, the anxiety, all of it hit me harder. Where are you? I still watch her, wonder where she's going, who her friends are, what her personal life is like. It never ends, the questions, the curiosity. She's walking down the hall now. We have to pass each other. I don't know if I love these moments or hate them. My stomach wants to shoot out my mouth. My heart wants to go into a rest. All these chemical reactions mess with my head. How you doing, girl? Her eyes so close to me again. This time, no fear, only sadness. I come to my senses. How you doing, girl? The feeling still burns. Nothing is satisfied. There is such an impulse to be where she is. I drive by her house. She's never outside. There's never a place for us to be at the same time. She's not on the internet. No clubs, organizations, no personal web pages. Why can't I forget her? Why can't I let her go? Every time she's near, everything stops. Nothing else matters. She has such power over me, yet I know nothing about her other than a few weeks of euphoric bliss. Bliss that just stopped and without warning, without reason. I start becoming aware of my state of mental health, which I know can be hopelessly unpredictable, yet controllable. Religion was taught to me liberally, but I always appreciated what the Tao had to say, that a 45% of what we think about is the past, 10% the present, and 45% the future based on the past. The key to achieving satisfaction is by expanding that 10% of the present into 100% if possible. This girl has made this impossible. For me, there is no present. The only things on my mind are the events of the past and what I want the future to be. How would I have fixed things? How would I have changed the past? What will I do in the future to accommodate the scenarios of the past? Is there even hope of a future with her? Will these feelings ever change? The problem with dwelling on the past and the future makes the present obsolete. I know I'm living in a world of fantasy and hope, and this girl is the subject. All this fantasy makes the present nothing but a barrage of yearning, frustration, desire, and anger. Yet none of these emotions get satisfied. My brain wants to work this out. I have given it too much and now it's mad at me. Ever since I lost her, it's been trying to help me. The dreams present me with the situation. I see her in passing, and she sees me. But no matter how hard I try to reach her, to say hello. Karen! I'm only running through water, trying to reach her as she disappears. I'm not asking questions anymore. Waking up from these dreams makes the cravings worse. Passing her house, watching her at school, reflecting upon her image. What happened to us, Karen? Why did it have to end up like this? Once in a while, the dreams provide me with more, with what I want. These are the dreams I never want to wake up from. You've made me so happy, Joe. I want you to kiss me. You're allowed to kiss me. Except you do wake up, and when it hits you that reality is eons from your desires, the world becomes a very dark place. Nothing seems to make sense. Has it been two years already? Who have I been for so long? How could one girl do this to me? Why is this love? Feel like this? Do I love her? Why didn't she Even if it is love, I, I don't have her. What did, did I do have to happen? 
So the once again, the my son is fighting these crimes. Why do I keep following her, thinking of her, insane. dreaming of her? Will I have her ever institutionalized? This feels nice. How long has it been since I felt this feeling? June, right? May. I saw your drawings on display, the Creative Arts Center. You know, that's pretty crazy stuff. Crazy, but interesting. Thank you. Here, I just wanted to show you my sketchbook. Diversion, rejuvenation, the questions remain unanswered, those feelings never satisfied, the conflict never resolved. Of all the questions I could have ever asked, they can all be summed up in one question, why? The truth is, nobody will ever know why. Right now, I could not be in such a better place. She could stay or she could leave, but worrying about where she's gonna end up just isn't worth the anxiety. So I'm gonna play my cards, and I'll let her play hers. She could leave, but at least I'll have this memory. Some conflicts just weren't meant to be resolved, so I'll do my part. I won't create the conflict. As a reminder, for your viewing pleasure, there are over 2,000 videos on the E-Town YouTube channel, where you can also subscribe in order to stay up to date with our latest offerings.
If you happen to tune in late and you've missed some of this week's program, the E-Town Podcast will have this episode and others, along with content from past shows as well. It'll be available for free in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, and other podcast directories. You're listening to E-Town. Hi there. This is Jennifer Berman, host of Rise When the Rooster Crows, a two-hour romp through diverse musical genres from Doc to Django, Avett Brothers to Louis Armstrong, and all magnificent musical manifestations in between. Tune in from 6 to 8 every Sunday morning or listen online anytime, only on YSA. I'm Nick Forster. This is E-Town. Patrick Watson and his band are going to be back later on the show. And coming up, singer and songwriter also from Montreal, Basha Bulat, is here. Um, lots more music in a bit. But before we bring back uh, the musicians, I want to tell you about what's coming up. Every week we get a chance to share a story of somebody that we heard about from listeners around the world, around the country, who tell us about people in their communities who are doing outstanding things across a variety of fields. Usually these are volunteers who look around, they see an issue, a problem, they try to address it in their own way, and always these stories add up, big things happen. So it's a great reminder that individual efforts do add up. We get to recognize these folks with the Achievement Award, and here comes Helen Ford to tell you about this week's winner. Thank you, Nick. This week's story is one of hope and a real can-do attitude. Brandon Dennison was born and raised in West Virginia. His parents were college teachers who provided a comfortable childhood for him, but he was always very aware of the poverty that existed all around him. While studying history and political science in college, he learned about the economics of his home state and how its dependence on the coal industry had, over the years, created deep challenges around increasing unemployment and problems related to that in terms of health, housing, and job opportunities. Well, he knew that people wanted to work, but needed help finding new ways to support themselves and their families. Eventually, he devised a plan to provide education, on-the-job training, mentoring, and jobs to folks in the southern part of the state, many of whom come from situations of long-time poverty or have worked in the coal fields but have lost their jobs to automation and shutdowns. Now, Brandon's here with us to tell us more, so please welcome this week's Achievement Award winner, Brandon Dennison of Wayne, West Virginia. Brandon, welcome to E-Town. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I'm so glad to get to hear your story and get to meet you because I think this is such a great idea and timely. Um, Helen mentioned that you're working with folks in southern West Virginia. Tell us a little bit about what their life is like and what kind of people you're serving. It's been tough times lately in southern West Virginia. I mean, even when coal was booming, it's tough times. I started Coalfield Development in 2010. And Coalfield Development is the name of your project. Right. It's yeah. our nonprofit. Yeah. And soon after we started it, really an employment crisis set in. So the coal industry had been on a steady decline for a long time. Then several factors came together and the bottom just fell out. And we had unemployment literally like what we had during the Great Depression. It was just an economic crisis. And so we're trying to find creative ways out of that. And just to be clear, some of that unemployment was really a direct result of two things, right? Automation, bigger machinery, mountaintop removal, different types of coal mining yep. that required fewer people plus the loss of interest in you know conversion of coal plants to gas and so on right yeah a lot of factors natural gas is one factor but also renewables i mean as renewables have grown yeah. and their market share coal's taken a hit right then that's good for the environment and i think you know, we need to have a more sustainable economy. But I also know being a lifelong West Virginian, it's hurt at the dinner table. And people are just feeling very scared and not sure what comes next. Yeah. When I was in college, I was very involved with a youth group at a Presbyterian church in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. We would do these service trips every summer. And the last service trip that I led was to a place called Mingo County, West yeah. Virginia, deep in the coal fields. And we were doing traditional volunteer work home repair for an elderly woman and as we were working these two young men approached us and they literally had tool belts slung over their shoulders and it was really really hot in July and they asked us if we had work available 
and I explained that we were just volunteers and they kind of went on their way and it could not have been more than a two minute interaction, but I felt like that completely summed up our situation in West Virginia, which is we have people who want to work, love to work, and want to be a part of something and want to contribute, but our economy's gotten so messed up that there's nowhere to really apply that gumption. Yeah, and those guys actually had some skills, it sounds like, if they had a tool Absolutely. belt and they knew what to do. Absolutely. Yeah. We have a lot to offer, and in many ways, the whole modern economy was powered by coal and so there's a lot of pride that comes with that and i think those skill sets can apply to the new economy too yeah so tell me how your your program works so we start new businesses in sustainable sectors we have a organic agriculture business we help start the first solar installation company in southern west virginia we have a company that makes t-shirts out of recycled material but then we use those businesses to put unemployed people back to work people from coalfield communities and essentially we're modeling what a new more sustainable economy can look like yeah and so uh, how do you find and how do you engage and interact with people who are looking for work and either have skills or are ready to be retrained? So we recruit in several main places, unemployment offices, public assistance offices, vocational programs, and then we organize the work week in a really special way. We call it the 33, six and three model. So 33 hours of paid work, it's a real job. Six hours a week in the community college classroom. So all of our crew members are enrolled working towards an associate's degree. Wow. And then and three hours a week of personal development. Ultimately, we're trying to deal with generational poverty cycles, and that's complex, and there's a lot to that. And so we're carving out three hours every week to go deep, to earn people's trust, and to really knock down those barriers to a full life one at a time. It's a major commitment to make it all the way through. In case you just tuned in, you're listening to E-Town. I'm Nick Forster. I'm here with this week's Achievement Award winner, Brandon Dennison. So, um three hours of community development. Is that about sort of like fundamentals of finance and how to balance a checkbook? Exactly and, right. A lot yeah. of dealing with money, getting healthy, you know, yeah. physically healthy, mentally yeah. healthy, emotionally well. Right. Um, this is sort of famous. Mingo County and neighboring counties are famous for uh, drug addiction, right? Yeah. The opioid crisis is very real. Yeah. And really, it's not that we're any more predisposed to be drug addicts than any other place, but it's a sense of helplessness. Poverty and desperation. Uh, yeah, right? it can yeah. set in, and so that's where that comes from. And so some of that time can be spent in either drug counseling or rehab or whatever. Yeah, we have a special partnership we call Reintegrate Appalachia, which yeah. is, you know, even when somebody gets clean, getting back in the workforce can be a major barrier. A lot of times there's a record, and so we're kind of a creative, passionate, patient bridge back into the workforce. So now you've been at this a while, and there's some success stories in the communities, and so that breeds success, and people tell stories about it. Do you have more people wanting to be in the program now than you can accommodate? We do. We always have a waiting list. Uh, our model is very effective. It's more effective than a lot of other job training programs because it's actually a job, too. A lot of people can't put their life on hold to get trained right. for several months. Yeah. But because these are real businesses, we can't hire every unemployed person, unfortunately. Um, how is it when you speak to those folks, knowing what I know about you, convincing them that this is the future? Is there an obstacle to solar panels and, and all that stuff? Sometimes there's some skepticism, but the main thing is former coal miners, it's proud hands-on work. And yeah. so they don't want to work in retail or service. They want to do work they can feel really proud of. And a lot of times, I think coal communities are thought of as like collateral damage in this shift to a more sustainable economy. And I believe we can be the leaders in the shift to the more sustainable economy. We have the hands-on skills that are going to be needed to retrofit buildings to be more energy efficient, to put strip mine lands back together to be productive ecosystems again, to install the solar systems on the roofs. We know how to do those things in West Virginia, and we have a lot to offer to the new green economy. Economy. That's so great because I don't think that's something many people would think of. They no. think of West Virginia as being stuck in this cycle of an old economy, an old energy economy, and lack of education, right. uh, lack of opportunity. So you think this could actually be leaders in the sustainable, renewable energy economy? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the solar company you know, that we helped start 
started in a used ice cream truck <laughs> as the tool van, and now there's 42 employees, and they have more work than they can handle. And I'm very optimistic, but even by my standards, growing up in West Virginia, to think that a solar company could take off in my lifetime, it's very encouraging. That's really cool. When did you start all this, Brandon? 2010. 2010. So how many people have been impacted by this so far? We've trained over a thousand people and wow. we've literally created hundreds of jobs. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> and you said that, um, you said that the organization that you started is called Coalfield Development and yes. it's a nonprofit. Yep. And is there a website if somebody wants to check it out? Coalfield-development.org. Coalfield, C-O-A-L-F-I-E-L-D, hyphen, development.org. Yep. And there's pictures and examples and, you know, people can see what you're doing. Or if they want to support you, obviously you're a nonprofit. Do you rely a lot on donations and grants to we do your do, work? yeah. It's a blend of our earned revenue from our businesses and yeah. donations for the personal development. Does the state of West Virginia support your efforts, too? <laughs> <laughs> Just like Canada would if you were in Canada? <laughs> You know, it's funny because I've, uh, <laughs> moving on, <laughs> I've played a lot of music. I'd like to talk about magic squares today. Definition of a magic square is that it is a square array of numbers and every column and every row add up to the same number. So to get started, I'll need a volunteer to suggest a number for me. So somewhere between, oh, let's say 35 and 50, anybody? 49. 49, okay. We'll write that down. And I'll try to uh, develop a magic square for 49. Let's go with uh, 4, 6, maybe a 5 there, and 11. A 29 and oh, some low numbers. One, three, thirty, eight, ten, nine. So, 31, need some more low numbers, 2, um, maybe a 28, 12, and 7. Let's see how well I did. Let's start with this row. 30, 38, 39, 49. So that checks out. 29, 30, 42, 49. That checks out. And I'll leave it to you to check out the other two rows. Couple of columns. Nine, nineteen, forty nine. This one, twelve and twenty eight is forty, forty nine. And the other two will work also. So that is, by definition, a magic square. But 
There's more, folks. <laughs> this magic square has additional properties. For example, this diagonal adds up to 49. I think this one does too. 29 and 11 is 49. So both diagonals add up to 49. But wait, there's more. If I do the four corners, that will add up to 49, I hope. <laughs> 20, 49, yes. If I add up the four numbers here in the center, 38, 49, they all work. There's even more. For example, if we look at uh, a three by three block, take any three by three square, 29, 31, 41. Does that one not work out? Okay. They, <laughs> 29, 39, 49. Okay. That, that works too. Another three. In fact, all of the three by three squares have the property that they add up to 49. even more strange stuff going on here. If we look at a two by four rectangle, something like that. that those four will add up to 49. In fact, I have uh, developed a, a little page here. In addition to what's required to be called a magic square, we have both diagonals, the four outside corners, the four inside corners, the four corners of three by three squares, the four corners of two by two square. The four corners of each two by four rectangles, the four corners of four by two rectangles. If you total it all up, we have a total of 26 sums to the requested number.
Ash, and welcome back to E Town. And am I right that this is the dress shirt that's on the cover of your new record? It's on my new record. Oh man, does it mean you have to wear that every night? Yeah, it's twenty five <laughs> bucks though at okay. the thrift store, so it's really it, good. It. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, it goes welcome. Far. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to hear you sing. This time I'm hearing it. And I don't know if I did the last time you were here, but I I wonder if Buffy St. Marie was in fact somebody you listened to when you were growing up and listening I, to music. I listen to her even now. It's yeah. one of those things that yeah, she's one of my heroes. That's so one of my heroes, yeah. Um, lovely new record. It's called Are You In Love? You've gone through a rough time in the last few years. I'm sorry to hear about your dad, but I know that oh, that sometimes you. can produce new inspiration and new focus for your songwriting. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the fact that Jim James produced your new record from My Morning Jacket. That seems like a slightly unusual connection for you to make. <laughs> Um, tell me, tell me about. How I that make came friends with people everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> there you are up in up in Montreal with your auto harp, and there he is in L.A. with his big beard and long hair. And somehow you found each other. Uh, it's about a decade ago now that we met. He was on tour for a record he did called Monsters of Folk. Oh yeah. And I've been a big fan of My Morning Jacket and of Monsters of Folk and yeah. Yim Yames solo. Right. And I just ran up to him and gave him my record at the time called Heart of My Own, which came out in 2010. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's scary to say. It's truly a decade ago. I've gotten away with that for a decade, which is amazing. And yeah, we just became friends over the years. And yeah. He's been very inspiring to me because he's someone who's not afraid to try different things. And he's really encouraged me over the years to push myself and just not be afraid of yeah. going into the left field. And were you recording? Is it that um, sort of crazy recording retreat? spa place is was that where you recorded was it high high des it's called high des yeah it's a very yeah. cool new studio yeah. um that's opened up in joshua tree yeah. and it, it we were probably the first band to record there so maybe we turned it into a bit of a, <laughs> made it cool a new age retreat of yeah. sorts yeah. <laughs> but um we'd end every day with a fire which was really really fun and I have never laughed so hard making a record in my life. I felt oh, that's like, cool. yeah, it was so much fun. Well, Basha, it's great to see you, you know, making new music and doing new things. Um, and it was a beautiful painting too on your album art. And it's nice to see that there's a distinguished painter who was really inspired and happy to be able to do your cover art. Yeah, my friend Chris Knight made an amazing yeah. painting. Yeah, and he's he and I have talked about music, and actually from around that same time we became friends. And just he's just someone who's inspired me forever and we just yeah. shared playlists and talked about music and art and yeah it's been wonderful as you mentioned my husband plays on this new record too oh, he, cool. he was he's somewhere maybe back there actually um his name's andrew woods and he did a lot of the really cool spacey atmospheric atmospheric things, things. Yeah. he yeah. was with you last time you were here I he think. was indeed yeah, yeah cool well listen congratulations on finding a pathway to a creative life thank and, you uh, that it's still vibrant and working well thank you let's get back to music welcome back if you would basha Bulat. um I decided while I was out in the desert to try and write a song about the most difficult topic I could think of. And for me, that's forgiveness. I don't think it comes easy to anyone all the time. So that's kind of where I was working from when I started this one. They say in time and fate, forget where you have been. Why can't I look away from the face I've seen? Saw it on those days we spent in the park. Saw you chasing dreams down the boulevard. And I saw your He's tired of drinking bitter wine When the cup it breaks in my hand each time How the cup it breaks in my hand each time Telling me
Free-range string quartet, Ludek Wojtkowski, Rebecca Durham, Stephanie Nienka, and Jocelyn Chandel. The record is called Are You In Love? Basha Bulat. This portion of E-Town is made possible by the Bohemian Foundation, building stronger communities through the Bohemian qualities of creativity and imagination. On the web at bohemianfoundation.org. If you happen to tune in late and you've missed some of this week's program, the E-Town Podcast will have this episode and others, along with content from past shows as well. It'll be available for free in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iTunes, and other podcast directories. You're listening to E-Town. It's jazz and country, blues, pop, and roots rock music heard locally and globally for over a century on records and later jukeboxes. We'll hear June Carter and Johnny Cash, New Orleans Kermit Ruffins and Danny Barker, and the Rolling Stones, then and now, on American Roots from PRX. Tonight at 11 on 913 WYSO. I'm Nick Forster. I'd like to say hello to our listeners who are hearing E-Town right now on stations like WETS in Johnson City, Tennessee, home of the Down Home, on WQKL in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and on KCHO in Chico, California. Thanks for listening. As always, if you want more information about anything we're up to or any of the guests this week, lots of stuff can be found at etown.org. You can find out how to buy tickets to live shows. You can see photos. And you can also check out our YouTube channel where we've got thousands of really good videos from all the E-Town shows past. Um, okay, so, so far pretty good, right? Patrick Watson, Basha, and the... And a great award. Brandon Dennison was great. <laughs> Meanwhile, we have lots more music to get to. Would you help me right now? Welcome back along with his band, Patrick Watson. I just want to thank Etar for having us. It's been such a pleasure. What a pleasure to come play music here. So cheers. Here's your rules. Swim. 
Watson, piano and vocals, Joe Grass on guitars, vocals, Erika Angel on backup vocals, Mishka Stein on bass, Evan Tai on the drums. The record is called The Wave. Such beautiful music. Thanks so much for being here. We've got time for one more song. We're going to do one more song. I want to thank all our guests. Thanks to our award winner, Brandon Dennison, coming from West Virginia, doing such great work, retraining, putting unemployed folks from the coal industry back to work, back to school. Thanks to Basha Bulat, coming from Montreal, along with the Free Range Quartet. By the way, the quartet is Ludek Wojcikowski, Rebecca Durham, Stephanie Mienka, and Jocelyn Schendel. Um, they did a beautiful job. Thanks to Ron Jolly and Helen Forster. Thanks to Patrick Watson and his band. Um, we had fun a few hours ago thinking about what song we were going to play right now. And this is what we came up with. I'm Nick Forster. Hope you can be with us next week right here in E-Town.
Join Tangella and I every Saturday night for Creature Features, right here on CATV.
well, that's somewhat rather interesting. What might that be? I'm sworn to secrecy. Oh, all right, if you insist. Tangella says that whenever you're off to make an extended visit to the Lou, you'll always carry in with you a comic book. I'm surprised you were still deceived into believing her baseless lies. I've seldom known her to ever lie. Then she has simply confused me with the bad habits of the handyman. I do not read comic books. I rest my case. Enough of this detour into toiletry. Welcome to Creature Features. I'm your host, Vincent, the bloke over to this side, claiming he does not partake in literary relief whilst sat upon the commode, would be my beleaguered butler, Mr. Livingston, and the dainty young lass over to this side, who can fashion an impressive pipe bomb using only common household kitchen goods, would be the lovely and congenial Miss Tangella. And do we have a most incredibly spectacular program in store for you? First, our guest will be joined by the wonderful Andrew Farrago. He's the curator of the legendary Cartoon Art Museum on Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco, a storied repository of comic book history, which was commissioned by the world-famous Charles M. Scholes himself. Andrew will tell us about this renowned collection, maybe bring a few rare items to share, and tell us how you can visit this shrine to the world of illustrative arts. He'll also chat us up about tonight's film, which will be The Night Walker from 1964, starring Barbara Stanwyck, Robert Taylor, and Hayden Rourke. Tangella, Hayden Rourke played Dr. Bellows on I Dream of Genie. Isn't that most superb? The story revolves around a wealthy woman who is traumatized by recurring dreams regarding her jealous and allegedly dead husband. This is yet another William Castle gem that we're sure you will all adore. So don't go away for this to be another night of gaslighting comic book fright right here on Creature Features. There you go. Thanks. Oh, can you leave Spider-Man next time? Right. Stay tuned. So, Andrew, do you know that if people were not watching our program and instead switched over to Channel 4 or 8, they could watch King Kong? That's a wonderful that nice? choice. King <laughs> Kong. Now, don't switch over. Tonight's movie is better than King Kong. This wasn't the good one. This is the one with What's-Her-Face. I do not like the one with What's-Her-Face. And look, there's only two helicopters and not... A thousand, as it should be. You need a thousand helicopters you to do. take a King you Kong. You do, for right? King Kong. Right. He's the king. Welcome to the show, and welcome you. you to the show. We've got Andrew Farrago, is that correct? That's correct. 100%. Andrew Farrago, you are the curator of the Comic Book Museum. The Cartoon Art Museum the in Cartoon San Francisco. The Cartoon Art Museum, yes. San Francisco. How long have you been doing this? Uh, over 20 years at this point. 20 years? You don't look old enough to have been doing anything for 20 years. It's the, it's the ink. The ink keeps you oh, young. Oh, is that it? Yes. No, it's the spirit of <laughs> looking at comic and, and illustrative art that does it, does it not? I think so. I think uh, I, know, I know more 100-year-old cartoonists than, than anybody. So this was <laughs> something that was helped to be created by Charles Scholes. So, yes. Uh, our founder uh, is a gentleman named Malcolm White. Right. Uh, very... Brilliant man, writer, publisher, friend of cartoonists, and right. he had an amazing collection that he wanted to share. And he figured out how to do that, and the best way to do that was to establish a museum. Uh, and Charles Schultz and his wife Jeannie uh, were uh, two of his biggest uh, supporters from, from day 